called How to Hear God's Voice. And the, the way the Holy Spirit gave me this topic, he, he put it on my spirit with urgency. Uh, when I say with urgency, I mean the way the way he gave me this topic is such that he, he genuinely wants people to understand this uh, because I believe very strongly that there is something that's going to happen in the future. And for each and every single person here to have the understanding here is very important. All right? It is very important that we all understand exactly how it is to hear God's voice. So I'm going to ask you guys some questions. In your daily lives, how do you get to hear God's voice? Go ahead. If you have any, if you have any experience in this regard, how do you hear God's voice? How? Yes, sir. Sometimes through other people. All right. For me, I've experienced it in prayer. Experienced it in prayer. That's very good. Anybody else? First thing that we're going to start with is we're going to start with our body, soul, and spirit. These three parts, I'll call them parts, these three parts are exceptionally important when it comes to hearing God's voice. Now, excuse my drawing, but here's a man. Yeah? That's your body, your flesh, muscles, bones, etc. Now, I want somebody to come up here and show me where your soul is. Who's, who's the brave person? Who can show me where your soul is? Test one. Using this diagram, where is your soul? Very good. Okay. Now, who can show me where your spirit is? Because remember, we're made in three parts. There's the body, there's the soul, and there's the spirit. And I'll show you evidence from scripture. Who can show me where your spirit is? Who's the brave soul that can do this? Where is your spirit? Very right. Very good. Somebody give them a round of applause. All right. So your soul is in your body. So you can look at it like this. Your body is what contains your soul. And then your soul is what contains your spirit. It's, un it's important for us to have this understanding when it, when it comes to, you know, hearing God's voice. And we'll see more of this. Uh, now, where is the evidence, you might ask? Well, think of it like this. In the book of Genesis chapter 2, you read from verse 7. The Bible says that when God created Adam, right, God breathed into Adam and Adam became a living what? So He became a living soul. So that would be the spirit. Remember, the word ruach, R-U-A-C-H, that particular word there in Hebrew means both spirit and breath. All right. So when the Bible says that God breathed into man, it literally means God spirited into man into man. So each and every single one of us, the reason why we're alive today is because that very spirit of God is in us. All right? The spirit of God is in us. Now you might ask the question, yeah, but what about people who aren't saved? Who can answer that question? Is the spirit of God in people who are not saved? Yes, but it's dead. Anybody else want to answer? Anybody else? No. Why'd you say no? Um, because this, I may be wrong. <laughs> but it's like um, the spirit of God cannot dwell within you because you are still wicked. You haven't been born again. When you are born again, he then enters you. And then the further you go, the more, the deeper it goes. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I would say, um, because we're made in God's image, yeah. uh, we are also spirit because God is spirit. Uh, but is it the spirit's care? I don't think so, just because of what David said. Okay. Alright, everybody said something that's very interesting. What I'll say is this. Unbelievers have a spirit, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Those are two different things. Unbelievers have a spirit, 
but the spirit that they have is not the Holy Spirit. Now, what happens is when we become born again, the Holy Spirit comes into our souls, this outer shell, this shell here, and he goes here and he engulfs this, this inner circle here. Do you understand? So the Holy Spirit dwells inside us. Now, I'll give you more evidence. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, if you have it, you can go ahead and read it. Proverbs 20, verse 27. I'm trying to build a case here for us to understand like the grassroots of everything and then we build some more knowledge on top of it. You guys are getting a deeper understanding of what it means to hear God's word. Proverbs 20, 27. Go ahead. It says, the spirit of the man is the land of the Lord, searching all the things of the Uh-huh. So the spirit of man is a lamp. Your spirit. So there's a spirit of man, there's also a spirit of God. Do you see? The spirit of man, which is this one inside here, is a lamp unto God which searches the inner parts of where? Of where? Of the heart. That would be this outer shell here. Now, we talked about body, soul, and spirit. Who can tell me what the three functions of the soul are? What are the three functions of your soul? Yes, sir. Fingers, uh... That, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, these are the three functions of the soul. You have your heart, so another word for feelings, you know, your emotions. That's what your heart is, right? Next one is your thoughts, your thinking, your, your thinking faculty, you know, your ability to rationalize. And then the third one is basically like uh, Ivan said, your sense of self. There was, a, there was a philosopher that, his name was uh, Rene Descartes, and he said, ergo cogito, ergo sum, or ego cogito, beg your pardon, ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am. Basically, the understanding there is that in your soul, you have a sense of being, a sense of existence. Do you understand? How do you know you exist if you don't have a soul? So you know you exist, why? Because you have a soul. Now, there's also biblical evidence for all of this. The Bible talks about, like we just read, Proverbs 20 verse 27, it talks about the heart, your, your sense of feeling, your emotions, it's all in the heart. Then you look in the book of Romans chapter 12, you read verse 2, it says that we should have our minds continually renewed. That's still part of the soul. Do you understand? Your ability to think, your sense of rationalizing, all of that is existent inside your soul. And then your sense of self, of who you are. Basically, the Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, you read from verses 4 and 5, it talks about how the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the putting down of strongholds, casting down every thought, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing our minds to the captivity. So what is that? That is your soul subjecting himself or herself directly to God. So your sense of self is one of the things that you swap with God. You understand? So when a person becomes born again, what you want to do over time is you want to swap your feelings for God's feelings. I don't know if you're understanding what I'm saying. When you become a Christian, you want God's feelings to become your feelings. So you give your feelings over to God. You now want your thoughts to become God. You want your thoughts to be God's thoughts. Do you understand? In other words, you take on God's thoughts for yourself. Do you see? All right. The Bible talks about in the book of Philippians chapter 2. I think you read from verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So God's mind becomes your mind now. You take on his mind. All right? And then the third one, which is the sense of self. Basically, when you become born again, it is no more you that lives, but it is Christ who lives through you. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Hands up if you understand. All right. So it becomes Christ who lives through you. This is very important when it comes to hearing God's voice. Are there any questions so far? Anybody got any questions? All right. So we'll keep going. Now, now based on all of this, there are... I think three very important things that need to be on ground for you to hear God's voice. All right. Next week, we're going to deal with something a little bit different to this, but it's still along the same lines. 
Three very important things. Now, who can tell me what those three things are? What do you think? Anybody? Alicia. Sorry. <laughs> Does your heart, <coughs> your heart have to be right with God? Fantastic. Anybody else? Anyone else have something else to say? All right, so those three things have actually already been mentioned, but I'll deal with what JB said first. Your heart position. All right, your heart position. If you ever want to hear God, your heart position needs to be right. How many of us understand this? Okay, fine. If you get it, then tell me why. Who can tell me why your heart position is of paramount importance when you want to hear God, JB? I look at it in a case of like, there's, there was multiple instances in the Bible yeah. where somebody's heart was hardened and because of that they couldn't hear God. Sometimes they hardened it themselves, other times it got to a point where he hardened it for them. But it seemed as though when their heart was hardened and turned away also, um, it became um, like a, it was almost like a barrier between communication and also understanding like a also a discerning because there's it's kind of like if your hearts and I think about people like there can be a person that there be a person that like backslides they know God is real or there can be a person that becomes corrupted shall we say and it's like it's because it's because their heart has been taken by something that's right, that's right. Anybody else have something to say? Yeah, I saw in a bad way to sort of human relationship with that in the sense of if you're trying to tell someone who's a heart, you wouldn't decide whether they're secure. You can say it's whatever you want, and I can't feel like I love you time. If our heart is being sort of pushed towards God, we don't even bother trying to say anything. We just have silence, go for what you go for, it's the consequences of what else we that's right. So the reason why you want your heart posture to be right before you can hear God is because if your heart posture is wrong, God will simply take you at your word. Because God is not, he's not a forceful person. All right. He's not forceful like that. What I mean by that is that God would not override what you have decided. If you've decided something in your heart, God will be like, fine, go ahead, have it your way. That's who he is. So if you really, this is why humility is important. Humility is of the heart. Do you understand? Humility is of the heart. So if you are humble and you decide for yourself, you know what, I want to hear what God has to say about this thing. I am going to humble myself in my heart. Do you understand? When you humble yourself in your heart and you decide that you actually want to hear what God has to say concerning that matter, then God will speak to you. Anyway, this is one of the very, very important uh, prerequisites for you to be able to hear God's voice. There are three that I, that I, you know, the Holy Spirit has given to me. I think each and every single one of those three is equally important. JB's mentioned one, the heart posture, and actually Felicia mentioned the other two, prayer and the word of God. But we're still dealing with the heart posture. If you go into the book of First Kings chapter 22, there's a story there. And this story is a little bit scary. Uh, I find it a little bit scary for a few reasons. Now, you have, uh, I think this is King Ahab. And then you had also the king of Israel. Now these two kings came together and they were like, yeah, we want to go to war. We want to go to war. So what did they do? They called several prophets and the prophets began to prophesy to them saying, yeah, when you go to war, you will win the battle. Go to war, you will win the battle. But there was one prophet, one prophet. <laughs> and this one prophet said, nah. But what happened? So this uh, King Ahab was like, yeah, go call this other prophet. The other prophet came, and then the other prophet began to prophesy, saying what the other prophets were saying. It was like, yeah, you're going to go to war, and you're going to win. But then the king knew that this guy was not telling the truth. <laughs> the king was like, just to be honest, what do you actually have to say? What is the actual prophecy? And then the prophet, his name was Micah, he said he saw in the realms of the spirit, and he saw God, and he saw the sons of God around God's throne. And then God said, who is going to go and lie to this uh, king for me? 
That's terrifying. It's terrifying. It's terrifying because it means that if your heart is set on an issue, God will actually help you by sending a spirit to lie to you. It's, it doesn't sound like God, but it's in the Bible. You can see it, 1 Kings 22. God sent a lying spirit to go to these prophets and to cause them to lie. There are some people who have decided within themselves, oh, God does, not, God does not exist. Fine, God will send a lying spirit to you to help you really believe what you think is true. That's what he does. So that, that is the reason why it is exceptionally important for you to humble yourself in your heart so that you don't get lied to. And by the way, it's not that God wants to do that to you. It's that he's simply giving you over to your own lusts. You've decided something in your own heart. So God just says, fine, go, go at it, go for it. Do you understand? So it is very important. So yeah, the first one is your heart posture. Heart posture number one. Somebody call us after me. Say YouTube. YouTube. Say YouTube. 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 And later on, if you've forgotten some of the things you've seen here, go on YouTube, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll find it there. All right. So number two. All right, so we can want to move along with this. Number two is pray. All right, now this is a pretty big one. It's a pretty big part, and it ties very much into this diagram here. Now, who can tell me how many? Uh, okay, with what two parts of you can you use to pray? What two parts of you do you use? During prayer. That's fine. <laughs> your mouth and your ears, okay. Anybody else believe? Your mouth and your will. Your mouth and your will. That's a very good point. Your mouth and your body. Your mouth and your body. What else? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Your mouth and your heart. Your mouth and your heart, okay. <laughs> yeah? Mind. Your mouth and your mind, alright. Russell? Oh, do you have something to say? Okay, everybody's mentioned something very, very interesting. Now, the two parts that you use to pray when you are praying are your spirit and your soul. I will explain why. <laughs> Who can open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, read verse 15. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15. Yeah, go ahead. 15, yeah. What is the conclusion then? Mm -hmm. I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with understanding. There you go. I will sing with the spirit, the spirit and I will sing with the understanding. There you go. So when you are praying, you are praying with either your spirit or you are praying with understanding. Understanding basically meaning your mind and your mind is in your soul. So when you are speaking in tongues, what are you using to speak? It is your spirit. All right. The prayer will come from your spirit. But then when you are now praying in English, you're praying in a language that you understand, it's coming from your mind, it's coming from your soul. Do you understand? Now, the thing is, it is very much possible, just as you can edify your body. What does it mean to edify? To edify is to grow something, to build something. So, for example, if I were to go to the gym, I would be building my muscles, right? But in the realms of the spirit, when you are praying with your mind, what you're doing is you're edifying your soul. But when you're praying with your spirit, you are edifying your spirit. Do you understand? Go ahead, James. I don't know if I'm jumping the gun here, but would yeah. you say that there is one that needs more? Th is more there one that is more imperative right. when it comes to hearing, or are they of equal value? That's a very good point, and actually, you're jumping the gun a little bit, but he's very much right. So, okay, fine, let me throw the question out there. Which one would you think is, let, let, I used more important in parentheses, right? Which one would you say was more important in edifying? than the other. So which one's more important? Felicia? The spirit, okay. Anyone else agree? If you agree, raise your hand. If you disagree, raise your hand. Yes, ma'am. Why do you disagree? So like, if we're, if we've got the Holy Spirit, like our soul, where our feelings and thoughts, we all reside over what we used to be too to, right? That's right. And so that means more, it, it's, it's uh, I see where I see where you're going. Actually, it sounds very 
almost sounds the the reasoning behind what you're saying is very similar to the, the people who are saying the spirit. Now, I'll tell you, it's the spirit. The reason why you want your spirit to be edified is this. Think about it like this. Uh, let's use the body, all right? Just your body. What you put inside your body can affect what your out your appearance looks like, right? Am I right? What you put inside your body, physically, the food you eat, there's a saying, you are what you eat, right? So if you're eating junk food, you look like, sorry. <laughs> if, you're eating, if you're eating healthy food, <laughs> if you're eating healthy food, you look also healthy. Do you understand? So what you're putting inside is what will therefore, you know, it's like a, a, um, a, a, a knock-on effect, right? It's a knock-on effect. What you put inside your body is what's going to affect your appearance. So what would affect you the most? Is it what you put just in this layer or in the deepest, most layer? It would be the deepest one, and that's your spirit. So when you put in your spirit, what you do with your spirit will eventually trickle out to your soul and trickle out to your body. The way to renew your mind, which is in your soul, is actually to build your spirit. Once you're building your spirit, it will trickle out to your soul. And as it trickles out to your soul, it will trickle out to your body. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So this is why prayer with your spirit is very important. Now, Paul does also say that it is very important that you also do pray with your mind. So, but then how do you pray with your mind? What does it mean to pray with your mind? Bearing in mind, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, we don't know how to pray. So, how do you pray with your mind? How do you do that? What's that? You just said to pray with scriptures. To pray with scriptures, very good. JB? Um, I would say, um, I would say uh, to pray about things that you are prompted from the Spirit. That's right, very good. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So, everyone's said something that is absolutely the case. It's very true. And I want to add this to it. Normally when you're reading scripture, this is because we're doing Bible study here, right? So, I'm giving you some tips on how to understand scripture, especially when you're reading on your own. One, of the, one thing that you will notice in scripture is that anytime the Bible mentions something in order, take the order of that thing into account because it's not by mistake. So for the Bible in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, 15, he says, I will pray with my spirit. That was the first one he mentioned. And then I will pray with my mind after that. So it means that when you're praying with your mind, first pray with your spirit. Pray with your spirit. After you've prayed with your spirit, then suddenly you will feel prompted to pray about something with your mind. So what JB said is very much true. The way you are, you are led, you are supposed to be led. All right, to pray with your mind, but that comes after you have prayed with your spirit. So, for anyone here who doesn't speak in tongues, I I really do think that you should you should speak in tongues. It's very important, and the reason why it's important is because this is what will help you pray with your understanding. If you don't have the if you don't have that gift, all right, or rather a sign, because the Bible says in Mark sixteen seventeen, these are the signs of they that believe who speak with new tongues. Do you understand? So it's a sign speaking in tongues. But if you don't yet have that sign, I think you should contend for it. The reason why you want to contend for it is because once you get it, it helps you even when you want to pray with your understanding. There are times when, for oh, there are times when, for example, with myself, if I'm praying in the Holy Ghost, I'm praying in tongues. Over time, it's like something will just drop on me, and then I know it, and then I'll just start praying it in tongue in English. Do you understand? I'll pray with it, pray it in my understanding. You know. This happens a lot of the time. Or sometimes I'm praying and then suddenly an image will just flash into my eyes. And then once I've seen that image, then I know what to pray about with my understanding. All right, so when you pray in tongues, your spirit is built up. When you pray in understanding, your soul is built up. All right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, because I'm a bit dumpy now again. <laughs> Unless I'm not understanding right, will you explain, please? So, if I'm born again, God's spirit is within me, isn't it? That's right. So, what's the difference then God's spirit 
um, uh, uh, I don't know the right word, like leading me, and then the Holy Spirit. What is the difference? Oh, very good question. So, remember what I said earlier. You have your own spirit, because when God breathed into man, Genesis 2, 7, he became a living soul. So you have your own spirit, but then your own spirit is not the Holy Spirit. There's the Holy Spirit, and then there is your own spirit. Now, when you become born again, what happens is that the Holy Spirit comes and he engulfs your spirit. It's like your own spirit is now swallowed up by the Holy Spirit. Does this make sense? Jesus said that when anyone is born again, anyone who loves him and obeys his commands, he will come and he will make up with them. How will he do that? By dwelling inside of them. 1 John chapter 4 verse 4. Beloved, you are of God because you've overcome the world, because greater is he that is in you. Where is he in you? Dwelling in your soul. That's where he is. Sometimes when you're speaking in tongues or you're, you know, you're really feeling the atmosphere, you're feeling the Holy Spirit. I don't know, is there anybody here who feels like a warm sensation in their belly? Do you, do you, is it just me? <laughs> no. You, feel, you get that sometimes, right? That is because he literally is here. Literally. I'm not talking spiritually or metaphor. That is where he is. He's right here. Do you guys believe what I'm saying? Because I think sometimes in Christianity, people become so spiritual that they don't know how to connect the spiritual things to the physical things as well. When you are born again, you, are, you receive the Holy Spirit, you become baptized in the Holy Spirit. He dwells literally inside of you. So this is why it ties very much so to hearing God's voice. Because sometimes when people are praying, they're in the place of prayer, they think they're praying to God who is all the way far away in heaven. No, he's right here. Do you understand? He's right here. So what you're actually doing and what you should do in the place of prayer is you should be, like sometimes for, for the sake of concentration, it's not like you have to. But what I'll do is I'll close my eyes and pray. And then I'll really focus on the God that I know that lives inside of me. John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. Anybody who is there can go ahead and read it. John 7, 37, 38. On the last day, that great day of the feast, mm -hmm. Jesus didn't cry out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believed in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living as living in his heart. There you go. Out of his heart. Another version says, Out of his belly. That is why when you are really in the presence of God, you can feel him in your belly area. Do you understand? Out of his heart. Now, there must be something in the heart for it to flow out, right? So that means that the Holy Spirit really does dwell in your soul. That's why he flows out of your soul. JB. So, a lot of the times, um, and I, I've like kind of had this conversation with like new converts and people that have an experience with God or with the, like with the Holy Spirit. They say they get like the, the kind of butterfly feel. That's right. How would you... How would you... Uh, like explain it to help someone differentiate between emotions and something spiritual that's happening. Because I feel like there's a lot of people that can get the two mixed up right. and then can even be deceived at times. Funny enough, that's actually part of what we're going to do next week. <laughs> it's part of what we're going to do next week because it's two sides to a coin. It's one thing to have the prerequisites down to be able to hear God's voice. It's another thing to actually tell when you have heard God's voice. You understand? Those are two sides of the same coin. It's one thing to have the prerequisites. So you're praying, your heart is right, you're studying the word of God, etc. It's now another thing for, because there are people who do this, but they don't know when God has spoken to them. So I'll give you, I'll, next week we'll talk about, yes sir, yes, thank you. I was going to ask, um, you know earlier you talked about the soul and the mind. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they separate things? No. If I'm saying heart, mind, soul, belly, same thing. So like your soul has thoughts, yeah. the, uh, like the real you, mm -hmm. and then like your soul, like essentially you have a mind. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. So it's like, say for example, in your physical body, uh, if I'm talking about your body, I could be talking about a particular part of your body, say for example, your arms, your legs, your eyes, your brain, whatever. So likewise, the soul has all these three very important specific functions as well. Your will is in your soul, your heart is in your soul, and your mind. All these three are in your soul. Do you understand? So it's very important that all these three parts of you 
in your soul need to be subject to God. All right? They all need to be subject to God. There's a particular funny word that I like to use for this. It's called intercourse. Of course, there's sexual intercourse, but there's other kinds of intercourse. This particular intercourse is normally when there's intercourse taking place, it's a swap, right? You're swapping something. So in intercourse with the Holy Spirit, what you're doing is you're swapping words, you're swapping feelings, you're swapping thoughts, you're swapping wills. All right, you're right. So your own thoughts become God's thoughts. You give it to God, God gives you his own. You give God your will, God gives you his will. You give God your mind, God gives you his mind. Do you understand? So there needs to be that. That's what's happening when we are praying. So to go deeper into the topic of prayer, what should you, if you want to hear God's voice, what should you really focus on in the place, in the place of prayer? What should you focus on? What do you think is a priority? If you want to hear God's voice in the place of prayer, what is the priority whilst you're praying? Be still and be quiet because how can you listen if you're in public? Huh? Okay, good point. You were going to say something? I would just say the word. The word? Very good as well. Very good. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. No one? Okay, I'll tell you. When you're praying, I think there needs to be some understanding here, especially when you're praying with your spirit. When you're praying with your spirit, what you're actually doing is that literally the Holy Ghost is using your lips to speak. That's what's happening when you're praying with the spirit. Go ahead. Is it right though? So if you can't, if somebody can't speak in tongues, they're not filled with the Holy Ghost? No, that's not it. I'll explain. Actually, that's a very good question. When you are born again, automatically you have the Holy Spirit. The moment you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. The difference between somebody who is speaking in tongues and somebody who does not speak in tongues is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So for example, what happens is, like I said, the Holy Spirit comes into your soul and he dwells in your soul. So when you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit in your soul. But then what happens is that when you become baptized with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit now fills up your soul to overflowing. And that overflowing is what we call speaking in tongues. So for example, say you have a cup, I can pour water into that cup, and there will still be water in the cup. But then speaking in tongues is when I pour water into the cup and keep pouring and keep pouring and keep pouring until the cup starts to overflow with water. That's what we call Holy Spirit, the, the um, speaking in tongues. I think the, the Greek word is like glossolalia or something like that. You understand? So that's what speaking in tongues is. So I think you can contend for it. It's very possible. Every single Christian can and should speak in tongues. I think Amen. if you read 1 Corinthians 14, Paul even says, I thank God because I speak in tongues more than all of you. <laughs> he, wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't be thanking God for that if it wasn't important. So it looks like it's very, very, very important. Every single Christian can and should speak in tongues. Do you understand? And if you're not doing so, go ahead and pray for it. You get it. Just have faith. Desire, have faith, believe, and go get it. Pray. You know, I think uh, Pastor Freddie was talking one time about a guy called William J. Seymour. William J. Seymour was like the, he, he's regarded nowadays, regarded, beg your pardon, nowadays, almost like the, 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 the father of the Pentecostal movement. This man was a black man. He was blind in one eye in the U.S., in Los Angeles. And he was a former slave at the time, actually. This was in the early 1900s. And what happened was he learned about the whole topic of speaking in tongues and all that stuff. And so he would pray for people, lay hands on them. And they would speak in tongues. But he himself was not speaking in tongues. So it was very confused. Like, why is it that when I pray for people, they get this gift, but myself, I don't have it. So he was very irritated one day. And he shut himself inside a room and stayed there for eight hours saying, God, I want to speak. God, I want to speak. And he was doing that for eight hours. And guess what? But that time, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he began to speak. And it was so strong that it kick-started what we now know as the Azusa Street Revival. All right. And the revival was so deep that people would be coming down from the train station in Los Angeles and they would fall under the anointing. It was that powerful. It was that powerful. Literal physical fire would be burning inside the building where they were praying. Physically. They actually had to call the Los Angeles Police Department to put the fire out. <laughs> but this wasn't physical. It was not human fire. It was Holy Ghost fire. Do you understand? So these are the, these are the possibilities when you speak in tongues. When you want to hear God's voice and you want God to speak to you, when you're in the place of prayer, prioritize what God thinks. Prioritize God's mind. 
prioritize God's will. Do you understand? Let it be a part priority in your soul. When I say your soul, I mean your mind. When I say your soul, I mean your heart. When I say your soul, I mean your will. Let it be a priority in your soul. Once you prioritize what God thinks, when you prioritize what God wants, that's when he begins to speak to you. Do you understand? This is why, like I'm saying, it's very important to speak in tongues because speaking in tongues is literally speaking what God wants. Yes, sir. Can I just read a scripture? It will probably help a little. Yes, sir. Uh, Romans 8, uh, 26. It says, I don't know if you've got this one. Yeah. Already. Are you going to read it later? Or should... Yeah, I think we put it earlier. Yeah. We know the whole words. thing. Oh, yeah. No, not the whole thing, just part, the, part of the first bit. But right. Yeah, because it talks about, so there's a few things that you've mentioned. So, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession with us, the groaning which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. That's right. Because he makes intercessions for the saints. So obviously there's a mind there that he has to know. And a heart that he has to know, just like you've, 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 you've obviously mentioned. And so with regards to speaking in tongues, as I've said, there's a whole uh, uh, dimension that you're missing out on when you're not praying in tongues. Because the Bible says we don't know what we ought to pray for. Our minds are, you know, a lot of the time you've had a hard day or, and, and you just don't know what to pray for, but the Spirit searches the heart and the mind and allows us uh, to pray what we actually need. So, for example, some, you might pray, for example, hey, I need, I always use this example, I need more money. In your head, you think you're shocked because you need more money, but the spirit searches the heart and he knows it's not money that you need, it's self-control that you need. And and that would essentially help with that problem. And so it's it's... Just like you said, it's very important because it, it, it puts you in a different dimension in regards to, to pray. You begin to tap into, into different areas uh, when you pray in the Spirit. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. So prayer is incredibly important. And not just, you know, praying for five minutes. One thing I can tell you is this. God likes when we give him open-ended time open-ended so when i'm not going to god saying god I, I i will give you five minutes in five minutes you have to speak to me nonsense god's not gonna like he's the he's the king he's the king you can't force the king to speak the king speaks when he wants to Amen. do you understand he speaks when he wants to speak so you must give him open-ended time otherwise don't expect him to say anything i've seen situations where a person has been asking god the same question for six months and god answers at the end of six months it's possible it's possible. I mean, God does it. What are you going to do? Take him to court that he didn't answer you earlier? <laughs> the only thing you can do is just be patient and humble yourself and just say, God, whenever you decide to speak is when you're going to speak. And I will respect that. And keep praying. Continue praying. A lot of the time, the reason why God will withhold his voice from you is because God wants to test your resilience. He wants to test what is in your heart. He wants to see this person that is coming to me to ask me this question now. Are they actually approaching me? Because they want, you know, because they love me or just because of what I can say to them. It's one thing to love God for who he is. It's another thing to love God simply because he speaks to you. Those are two different things. They are intertwined and they do overlap, but those are two distinct things. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. I can love somebody just because of who they are. I just love the person. But then I can also love the person just because of what they give to me. In terms of their time, their affection, the fact that maybe they speak to me in a certain way. That is, it's almost transactional. Do you know, there are people who are in relationships because they love how the other person makes them feel. It's good, but it is not the end. You should be in a relationship with someone that you love just because you love them. I just love this person. Now, should you have reasons for loving them? Absolutely. You should be able to mention them. If I ask any man here, why do you love your wife? Or why do you love the person you want to marry? I should, I should get, I should get hardcore, <laughs> real evidence. Yes, yeah, she does this, she does that, she does it. You should be able to list them all. But the thing is, at the end of the day, behind all of that, you should still love the person just because, just because.
So God will actually test these things. He will look at you and say, okay, fine, you're approaching me. Let me see how patient you are. Let me see if you want to strong arm me. Like, you know how some people, they try to put God's arm behind his back. <laughs> you can't do that. God wants to see how patient, how humble are you? Are you going to be patient? Are you going to be humble? Do you understand? God wants to see all these things. So in the place of prayer, if you really want to hear God's voice, make sure your heart is in a position of complete and utter humility. Go ahead. Fasting. Fasting, 100%. 100%, 100%. Actually, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, I humbled my soul with fasting. Correct. You can humble your soul with fasting. If you want to be a humble person, please do not pray this prayer. Oh God, humble me. Don't pray it. <laughs> Don't pray it. It's not a good idea. <laughs> because if you pray that God should humble you, he will not humble you. He will humiliate. There's, there's a difference. He will humiliate and embarrass you. And then after you're embarrassed, for sure, you'll be humble. <laughs> for sure. So decide for yourself, I'm going to humble myself. Let me do that by myself. I want to humble myself so that God doesn't have to humble me. Do you understand? So the, go ahead. Just could you give other ways apart? Is there anything else? Is it just fasting that you can humble yourself? Sorry. We talk, speaking of humbling yourself yeah. before God, is there any other way apart from fasting that you can humble yourself? Good point. This brings us to the third one, the word. All right, so we've dealt with your heart position. Second one is we've dealt with prayer. And by the way, just to reiterate with prayer, when you get into the presence of God, tarry in his presence. Wait, don't rush out. Get into God's presence and stay there. Remember, when you're speaking in tongues, it is literally God's mind you're speaking. All right, it's God's mind. Now, there's something that we'll speak about at the very end. It's called meditation. I'll tell you guys exactly how to meditate because there's meditation is very much important even as Christians. It's not just for Buddhists and mm. whatever. No, meditation is incredibly important. And I'll tell you the Christian way to meditate at the very end. Mm -hmm. Because this is very important when you want to hear God's voice. All right. Meditation takes into account your heart position, it takes into account prayer, and it takes into account the word of God. It puts all these three things together. So I'll tell you how to meditate at the very end. So we're dealing with each one, each like uh, a little part of meditation. We're dealing with it individually, and then at the very end, we'll put everything together and we'll see what that brings us. So the word of God. Now, who can tell me why the word of God is very important when you want to hear God's voice? Anybody? What is the significance of the word? Sir, I think you can often see parallels in the meaning. So, you know, let's say, for example, you heard something and you want to be kind of sure. Um, usually, there's uh, scripture to kind of back. back uh, yeah, that's right. yeah, there's that scripture that says uh, every scripture is God breathed. So, you know that God speaks through the scripture and, and Jesus is the word himself. So um, you can kind of expect to hear from him if he was the voice, but also the word directly as we read it. I was going to say the same to Tim that it would align, align with. Um, yeah, I would say that a lot of times God can say something to you and you may not grasp it fully, but when you read the word, kind of fully illuminates uh, every part of it. It, it. it kind of gives an extra dimension of understanding to what to what he told you.
from what they've got as well. If you don't believe something, you're not going to go out the world to fix it, so you can. But it kind of shows the first time that you don't want to get it or not. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, also um, brings to remembrance. Um, uh, so that let's say now <coughs> the Holy Spirit speaks to you and um, and you wasn't quite sure but when you go to the word of God that will confirm that so that that also um, it also protects you from being deceived so let's say that uh, uh, you get a thought and you wasn't quite sure whether that was from God or or a different spirit, you can test that using the word of God. There's, I believe there's over, just over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Um, when you pray, you should pray. In fact, there's 8,000, but some of them are specifically for the Jews. But the 7,000, I think it's like 7,100 and something. When you pray, well, obviously if you read the word, you can pray some of those promises in your own life. You can receive them in prayer. So God, your word says this, let it be so in my life. And I think that's why, you know, when you pray, knowing your word and knowing, knowing the word and knowing the promises, um, it can really begin to transform your life when you begin to accept and believe those promises. Yeah, I guess uh, if you're praying on something and um, God forgive you and um, a Bible verse to confirm that and also maybe even go into more detail uh, on the thing that you're praying about to be more clarity. Very good. Everyone said something that's absolutely the case. You know? um, but I'll add this to it. When you're praying, the reason why the Word of God is important when you want to hear God's voice is because specifically the Word of God was actually designed for your spirit. The Word of God is for your spirit. We're going to deal with this a little later on when we talk about meditation. There's a reason why the Word of God should be in your spirit. I'll explain. Who knows about the armor? The armor of God. You have the helmet of what? Okay. The breastplate of the sword of the spirit, which is the word. the word of God. Sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You understand? When you have the word of God in the realms of the spirit, your sword is long. Those people who have more scriptures in their spirit have a longer sword. The more scriptures you have in your spirit, the longer your sword is. And then the more you pray in the spirit, the bigger your spirit is. So as you now combine prayer in the spirit with the word of God, not only do you grow tall in the realms of the spirit, but you also have a longer sword. Amen. There are people who pray a lot in tongues, but they have no word. They are just huge in the realms of the spirit, but their sword is like this. <laughs> and then there are people who have plenty of the word of God, but they don't pray at all. So the word of God in their spirit, their sword is like this, but then they are just like this. <laughs> do you understand? So you need to combine the two of them. The two of them need to be there. You have the word of God and you have praying in tongues. You put those two together, you become a giant with a massive sword. Please clean your mind. Do you understand? Wow. <laughs> Do you understand? I hope everybody's understand what, understanding what I'm saying. When you have the word of God and you put that word in your spirit, you are growing in the you are basically battle ready. Do you understand? You are battle ready. Life, whether you like it or not, is a battle. Life is a battle. There's something that Paul said. He said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Life is a fight. Do you understand? It's a fight. So if you want to hear God's voice, make sure you put that word in your spirit. Now, I'll tell you how to put the word of God in your spirit. Because there are many people who think they are putting the word of God in their spirit, but they're only putting it in their soul. You think the word is going into your spirit, but it's not. It's only going into your soul. There are techniques to put the word of God in your soul, and it is important. But then what you need even more so is to put the word in your spirit. Do you understand? Now, the Bible talks about the word of God. The word of God is like firewood. It's like firewood. It is the raw material that you need to keep your, your fire burning. 
If you want to be on fire for God and you want to really be somebody who hears God's voice, let the word of God be on fire inside of you. Um, you know how you're saying that some people are only putting it in their soul. Right. If it's if it's in your spirit, mm -hmm. it's also in your soul. But if it's not That's right. If it's in your spirit, it's in your soul. Okay, yes. so but so it has to just go to the deepest point. Right. Okay. That that exactly. was okay. Exactly. I wanted to know if there was a, like a differential, but it, it but 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 because the spirit is obviously deeper, if it's there, then it will emanate throughout. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask: Is there a difference between memorizing a scripture? Don't worry, <laughs> no, we're going to talk about that. Go ahead. To your point, Tim. Sorry for jumping in. Yeah. A lot of people they know it, but. It is head knowledge. So what good is head knowledge? We we need the spirit, like you say, to be a light. So if we're just reading it to be clever, we know the Bible is pointless. It's not going to do anything for us. We need to store it, and the God says He will bring it back to when we for when we need it. That's right. Exactly right. Exactly. Anybody else want to say something? All right. So yeah, that's it. The Word of God is very very. Very, very, and I can't stress this enough. If you want to hear God's voice, you need the word of God. Do you understand? When you want to hear his voice, you want God to speak directly to you. Now, it is very possible, and I think everybody, everybody here must believe this. It is very important that you believe this. It's important that you believe that God can speak to you directly. You have to believe that. If you don't believe that, then I don't know why you're a Christian. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I, Jesus, know them, and they follow me. So if you, if you can't hear God's voice for yourself, it means you're not his sheep. That's a problem. Because it is only God's sheep that can make it to heaven. You must be in a position where God can speak to you directly. It is incredibly important. Do you understand? He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You can only follow Jesus if you can hear it. You can only follow him if you can hear him. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, you talked about thinking. Essentially, the only people who can make it to heaven is who can hear God's voice. Mm -hmm. so let's say you've got a Christian who has been saved two months, three months, or even six, but they don't understand this dimension of hearing God's voice. You know, they're saved, born again, they're living right. Well, where does that person stand? Every person who is saved has heard God's voice. There's no way that they've saved if they haven't heard God's voice. Every single person who is saved has heard God's voice, whether it was directly or through someone preaching the gospel to them. They heard his voice, and that's why they were able to accept it. You can see this in the book of Romans chapter 8. The Bible talks about how could they be, how could they be saved if no one preached to them. And how could not everyone preach to them if they, weren't, if they were not called in the first place and then sent? Do you understand? So... Every person who is saved has heard God's voice. So there's a difference between hearing God's voice to be saved and then hearing God's voice to walk through life. There's the voice of God that brings you into salvation and there's the voice of God that leads you in the path of salvation. Do you see? So anyone who is saved, you've all heard God's voice because we're all saved. But then there's that voice that you also need to lead you in the right path. Because obviously once you're saved, what are you going to do now? You're not going to die the instant that you're saved, God forbid. So that means now you're alive, you're saved, what do you do? The Holy Spirit begins to direct you with his voice. He tells you, do this, take this road, don't take that road. I can tell you so many instances in my life when the Holy Spirit has directed me with his voice. Come in direct to me, personally. And the Holy Spirit is like, yeah, go in that direction, fine, go in that. Like there was a time when, <laughs> this was in London, and I just wanted to go out on a walk. And I went out on this walk and I didn't know where I was anymore. And I was like, hey God, what do you do now? And so I just said, Holy Spirit, please just tell me where to go. And then literally as I was walking, turn left, I turn left, turn right, I turn right. I keep walking, I keep walking. And then all of a sudden I come out into a place that I actually know and from there I go home. That's the Holy Ghost. He's very able to do that for each and every single one of us. My dad was telling me one time that he experienced a very similar thing. My mom went to someone's house uh, 
to, to do the person's hair and my dad had no idea where this house was and my mom I think my mom's phone was dead at that time so she couldn't send him the address so that he could get there by by the the GPS so he just got in this car and said Holy Ghost it's up to you now <laughs> just tell me where they so the Holy Spirit was like go left go left go right go right go for go straight keep going keep going he kept going and then the Holy Spirit now said alright stop the car he stopped the car and literally the house was just right there just like and he'd never been to the house before didn't know the, never met them he just literally followed the voice of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit directed him just to literally the house was just a couple feet from where he parked that doesn't make any sense but it does when you have the ability to hear God's voice for yourself each and every single person here can do that you understand and the thing is sometimes I think the reason why people are a bit weary about hearing God's voice is because they want to hear everything at once if God tells you all the information you need in one go you will die yeah. that's just the truth you will just die because the Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. God will not reveal everything to you at once. He'll reveal bits. He'll reveal bits. And sometimes I think the reason why, you know, you have to have faith, by the way, to hear God's voice. But then also hearing God's voice brings faith. Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. You know, the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, by the word of the Lord. So when God's voice comes to you, this is what we call rhema, by the way. So it's like a revelation. God's word just comes to you. All of a sudden, you understand something. It builds your faith. You understand? But then people want to hear everything in one go. They want to know everything at once. It doesn't work that way. God will simply reveal bits to you, and he will expect you to grow in your faith as he's revealing it. Do you understand? You're expected to grow in your faith as he's revealing his word to you. And then the more you grow, the more, he, the more bigger chunks he can give to you at once. As a baby Christian, he'll reveal little by little by little. As you grow, he will reveal bigger, bigger chunks. So for those of you who want to be hearing God's voice so audibly about what God wants to do with the nations, it's possible. You can get to that place, but then start from little and grow. Start little and grow. That was me. I was like, God, I want to hear your voice. God said, okay, fine. You want to hear? So he would start telling me little, little informations here and there. And a lot of the time, what he will start with, he will start by revealing you to yourself. He will show you who you really are. Remember, Proverbs 20, 27. The spirit of man is a lamp unto God that shows the inner parts of your heart. So God will use you. He will use your spirit to show you who you are. And then he will now expect you to, after he's now shown you about yourself, he will now expect you to do something about yourself. God can show you somewhere, uh, I don't know, any, anyone here. He can show you that in your heart there is a particular void. And this void is very susceptible, uh, susceptible, susceptible, beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. It's very susceptible to, I don't know, uh, lust, thinking lustful thoughts. After God has revealed that to you using your spirit, he will now expect you to get rid of, those, of that susceptibility. He will expect you to get stronger in that area in your soul. And then as you're doing this, as you're growing, you will start revealing things even about other people. Do you understand? And then from other people, it can grow to now revealing things about what's about to happen politically in the nation. If you look in the Bible, you look at the prophets of the Old Testament, you look at people like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, all these guys were prophets who God used to reveal literally what was happening in the political climate. Do you understand? God can do this through each and every single person here. It's about whether you're willing to submit to yourself to the Holy Spirit in this regard. If you're willing to just open yourself up to God actually speaking to you and growing to that level. It's not going to just plonk you in that level. You have to grow to it. Do you understand? It is better to grow up than to go up. It is better to grow up than to just go up. Because anything that goes up can... Calm down. But if you grow up, you are founded. You are just standing strong. Do you understand? So it's very important. All right? This is why we need the word of God. If you have the word of God in the realms of the spirit. Remember, that I, I heard someone say something once. That if you want to hear God's voice, then read the word of God. But if you want to hear God's voice audibly, read it out loud. It's the word of God. If you want to get hear God audibly, read the word out loud. And that's what I do. Anytime I'm reading the Bible, I read it out loud. I don't read it in my mind alone. Obviously, if I'm reading it out loud, am I not reading it with my mind? 
it's going into my mind, is, but I'm reading it out loud. Now, there's another step we'll talk about, about uh, meditation. Because now that we've talked about your heart position, prayer, and the word of God, we'll now put all these three together, and this is where we now begin to speak about meditation. It is in the place of meditation that you can hear God's voice. Do you understand? It's in the place of meditation that you can hear God's voice. Now, next week, like I said, there are two sides to this. There's the side where you prepare yourself to hear, and then there's the side where God actually speaks. How does he speak? That's what we're going to deal with next week. You understand? How does he feel? How, how can you tell when God has spoken to you? Because sometimes people expect God to speak to them with like a massive booming bass voice like, my child. <laughs> <laughs> my child, go in this. No, it doesn't work that way. Now, can God do that? Of course, he can. He can do whatever he wants. Amen. God can speak to you audibly. It's very possible, and I'm absolutely by no means ruling that out. There are many people that God has spoken to like that before, including myself. I've heard it, but it was in a dream. It was in a dream and it was loud. I think I heard him like my right ear or something like that. Do you understand? So it's very possible that God can do that to you. But then the thing is, the vast majority of the time, God is going to speak to you in very, very particular and subtle ways. And I'll tell you next week why God speaks to us in subtle ways rather than like theatrical. Because I think people like the theatrics. You know, we like everything to be theatrical, very dramatic. But God is like, nah, like low key, you know, low key. So we'll deal with that next week. So anyway, let's go into meditation. Now, meditation is <laughs> a very, very underlooked part of Christianity. It's very underlooked, and it's very. Uh, what's the word that I'm going to look use now? It, it's something in Christianity that not many Christians speak about or do or practice meanwhile it is actually one of the most important parts of being a christian it's exceptionally important between abraham isaac and jacob who was the one who meditated between abraham isaac and jacob who meditated between those three say jacob okay who is who else jacob Say Jacob. I'll tell you, it's Isaac. It's Isaac. As a matter of fact, the Bible actually says that when, uh, is it Rachel or Rebecca, whichever one, Isaac's wife, when they were coming to visit Isaac, the Bible says that Isaac was in the field meditating, and that's when he saw his wife. Amen. So they were brebs for some of you single fellas. Do you understand? But that's when he saw his wife. Now, the Bible says in Psalms chapter 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on his law does he what? Meditate. Meditate when? Day and night. On the law does he meditate day and night. Now, I'll tell us what meditation is for us Christians. Meditation is in three parts. All right? Meditation is in three parts. Like I said, for those of you who didn't bring notes, next week, uh, bring notes. But then, for now, there's YouTube. Praise God. So, <laughs> meditation is in three parts. Now, the first stage of meditation is the quiet stage. In this stage of meditation, this is when you take the word of God because it is in the law. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Who can bring that up? Joshua 1 verse 8. Joshua 1 verse 8. Yes, go ahead. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have your success. Thank you very much. It says again, you see there, meditate day and night. Same with Psalms chapter 1. Day and night. If, if this is for anyone here who likes to study their Bible. Anytime you see something mentioned in two different places, know that that becomes automatically like a law. The Bible says that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. So if you want to know when there is an established fact, an established precedent, find it in two places or three places in scripture and you know it's established. For the Bible to say meditate day and night in two separate books, it means it is a very much established thing that every Christian should be doing. Do you understand? So meditating in the day, in the, in the, in the law, how do you do this? Like I said, stage number one is the quiet stage. You're meditating in the word of God. I don't know, is there anybody who's getting where I'm going? Let's see. 
What do I mean by in the word of God? Mm. You're meditating in it. Go ahead. You know, like, um, you only pick your Bible up when you want to find something. Yeah. You should have your Bible on a daily routine, so you're meditating it, so you're feeding your spirit, but it's right. like you're, you're meditating on the way, what what, what the end progress is, what you need to be by by mm. reading it. So it's, uh, I don't know, I see it as meditating. Yeah. Reading means meditating. Right. Um, I think, is it like, um, rather than reading just for reading's sake, you're, you're taking a small section and dwelling on it and thinking about what it actually means and right. meditating on it. That's right. Very good. Yeah. Um, like you're saying, um, in it, in the quiet time, is that when you're, because I know in the Bible it says, um, it says that when you pray you should go in, into your room. Um, and it's like, so is, is it like you're, you're in the secret place and you're in the private place, just in God's word, not necessarily studying, but just in it, but just allowing yourself to just be immersed in his word, in silence, in the, in the secret place. Yeah. I was going to say like that. Okay. Very good. Okay. So like I said, the first stage, and I think pretty much everyone was right in this one. The first stage is when you take the word of God, all right, you open it to wherever you want to meditate on, right? And you begin to take that verse and repeat it over and over in your mind. Take the verse and repeat it over and over in your mind. Now, when you're meditating, you should ideally have a notepad and a pen. Do you understand? Have a notepad and a pen because what's going to be happening is that as you're taking this word and you're repeating it over and over in your mind, suddenly you start getting new revelations from it. Suddenly you understand something that you didn't understand before. The importance of meditation is to grow in revelation. And I can tell you this, this is the way to put the word of God in your spirit rather than just your soul. Remember, we talked about how people put the word of God in their soul and not their spirit. How do you put the word of God in your soul? By memorizing it. You say, oh, I'm going to memorize this, and then you just read it, read it, and read it until you memorize it as if it's a play. The Word of God is not a play. The Word of God is more than a play. You know, I've, I've seen uh, people who talk about <clears throat> trying to memorize the Word of God, and it's very good to have the Word of God in your soul. Absolutely do that. But then the way you want to, like, for example, myself, not to brag, but by the grace of God, I've got like 300 verses all in my spirit. The reason that is the case is because I put the word in my spirit, not just my soul. If I decide to memorize the word of God as if it were a play, I wouldn't remember it. Yeah. I wouldn't remember it because the word of God is too deep. It's too heavy for your soul to carry alone. So what it actually should be is you put this word in your spirit. So I'm telling you, yes sir. No, not finished. No, finished. Not finished. <laughs> I don't want to stop you. <laughs> All right. <Not> <laughs> So I'm telling you, I'm telling you how to put this word in your spirit. Remember what I said? The word of God was designed for your spirit. That's what it's for. And so once the word of God is in your spirit, your soul will be transformed. Do you understand? Once the word of God is in your spirit, your body will be transformed. For people who are sick, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 4 verse 22, it says the word will be health to your flesh. How will it be health to your flesh? When you put it in your spirit. The way to make this word come alive in you is by putting it in your spirit. Do you understand? When the word becomes life to you, people think, oh, every promise in the Bible is for me. True, but also not true. It's true, but it's also not true. Why do I say that? It's true in the sense that God has intended for it to be yours, but it's not true because until it becomes alive to you, it cannot be yours. You want good health, fine. God says it's for you. But then until you get it in scripture and put it in your spirit, it will not be a life in you. You want wealth and finances. Good. Very good. God wants it for you as well. But it, until the word about your finances becomes true and alive to you in your spirit, it can't happen. So you have so many Christians who are almost like walking uh, oxymorons, right? <laughs> <laughs> like a walking oxymoron where they believe one thing and they say it's supposed to happen in the word of God, but it's not true in their life. Why? Because that word has not become alive to them in their spirit. So I'm telling you how to put the word in your spirit. Go ahead, sir. I think, yeah, what you're saying, I think if anyone, any of the guys have ever preached it, like you spoke about revelation, meditation, like you're saying about putting the word, if, you, if you've ever preached or put together a sermon, 
when you look at that scripture, that scripture begins to jump out at you. Things begin to come out at you. You begin to get a better understanding. And if you think any time you've ever preached, you always you always remember that scripture. Yeah. Because it's a it, there's a lot there's there's a deeper meaning to it now because you've looked at it. It's jumped out at you and it's become part of you. So it's a hundred percent true what you're yes, saying. Sir. Absolutely. All right, so you need to put this word into your spirit by thinking about it. Take the verse and just think. 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 Take the verse, repeat it over and over in your mind. Now, this is going to have to take a whole lot, a whole lot of self control because your mind is going to want to do the most. You're thinking about the word of God, suddenly one weird thought just comes to your mind just like that. <laughs> You're acting as if it's only me. I know it happens to you guys as well. Sometimes when you want to keep your mind clear, all of a sudden you just think about one weird, strange, random thing. But this is going to have to take some self-control. So you're going to have to set out a couple hours to do this. Train yourself in this. All right. When you first begin, it's not going to be that easy. But then when you continue over time, it becomes a whole lot easier. You understand? So put this word, think about it. Think. Mull it over. As a matter of fact, the word in Hebrew which talks about med meditation, means to mutter, almost like to chew. So this brings us to the second stage of meditation. The second stage of meditation is when you now begin to repeat the words in scripture over and over again. Repeat it until you get even more understanding, until you get even more revelation. Do you understand? A lot of the time, I think people just stick with the very first stage. They just think and think and think and think and think, but they, they don't mutter. You quietly mutter it to yourself. For example, I'll give you an example. Okay, Psalms chapter 110. All right, Psalms 110, let's say uh, verse 3. It says, your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Now, if I want to meditate on this, I'll quietly, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. What does the word say? So this is what is happening in my mind. It's, I'm not saying anything. It's just what's happening in here. The, the people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. The beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your womb. The people shall be volunteers. People shall be volunteers. People shall be volunteers. So that means that there are people who can volunteer to do the work of God. There are people who can volunteer out of their own will. They decide, you know, I want to go and do this. Okay, fine. In the day of your power. In the day of your power. In the day of your power. So that means that there is a day when God's power becomes ob it becomes obvious. So if there's a day when God's power becomes obvious, then that is the day when people begin to volunteer. Okay, fine. All right. In the beauties of holiness. Holiness is beautiful. All right. From the womb of the morning. 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 So that means that there is a time. The morning has a has a mother. Something gave birth to that morning. Who is the mother of the morning? Who gave birth to that morning? Because it says to the womb of the morning. You understand? Who gave birth to that morning? It must be God, isn't it? God is the one who gave birth to it. God is the one who created the new day. And then the thing is, as you're meditating on the scriptures, more scriptures will come to mind. All right? There'll be new things. For example, the Bible says, this is the day that the Lord has. Uh -huh. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So if it is the day that the Lord has made, it means that God is the one who produced who gave birth to the morning. Okay, fine. You have the dew of your youth. The dew of your youth. What is dew? What is the Bible talking about? Dew is like a little bit of water, a little bit of mist. Okay, dew of your youth. So that means there's something about youthfulness that is so like... Uh, sorry? Fresh. Something about, something about the youth that is fresh. Something about youth that produces even more life. Because for there to be dew, there needs to be water. There's water, the Bible talks about Psalm chapter 1, says that he's like a tree planted by rivers of living water. Okay, so this is what is going on in your mind. You're literally going over the word of God, repeating it, and you're getting new revelations from the word of God. You're getting new revelations, you're getting new insights, new understanding about what the word of God is saying. Do you understand? That is why you are meditating in the word of God. You take this and you meditate, not about your life. This is not meditating about your life, no. You're not thinking about, oh, I need to do X. Oh, maybe God can help me to do Y. Oh, maybe this, no. You're going in here and thinking about this is your priority. Do you understand? This is your priority. This is everything to you during meditation. Everything. Okay? So that's what's going through your mind. Now, the second stage, like I said, you begin to mutter. So literally, you're muttering to yourself. Your people shall be volunteers. The day of your power. 
Jesus is according to this prayer. In the womb of the morning, you have to do your thing. The people shall be volunteers and they have the power. And they do the things Jesus is according to this prayer. In the womb of the morning. So you're muttering it to yourself until it becomes living to you. Suddenly you begin to see new things in the word of God. There, there are a few, I remember the very first place, the very first place that I memorized in this manner was 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. And I can remember it because I think it was like, uh, it was when I was in third year. Yeah. I was, in, <laughs> I was in third year, it was in 2019. I remember it. And basically what happened was, my dad was, we're doing a, 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 um, prayers, and my dad was lead, leading the prayer over Zoom. And, um, you know, I, I was like, okay, this is really interesting. So he quoted that particular scripture, 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 4 and 5. Chapters, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. He mentioned it. And then I just began to repeat it over and over to myself. Because it's like that verse or those two verses suddenly became new, new to me. I suddenly, just in one moment, I just learned something from those two verses that I didn't know before. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the putting down of strongholds, casting down every thought and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing our minds hmm, to the captivity of the obedience of Christ. I found that very interesting because I realized for the first time, oh, so it means that the weapons of our warfare are not just to kill a witch. It's, <laughs> it's useful for that. It's useful for that, but it's not primarily for that. It's actually primarily to bring our minds to the captivity of the obedience of Christ. Once I realized that, I was like, oh, so if I now want to control my thoughts, I need to use the weapons of my warfare to do that. If I want to control what my mind is thinking, I should use the weapons of my warfare. What is the weapons of your warfare? Helmet of? Salvation. Breastplate of? Righteousness. Shield of? Sword of the? <coughs> knees shod with the what? With the gospel. Exactly. That is the, those are my weapons. Now, there are plenty other more weapons as well, but these ones primarily, I was like, okay, fine. So now I need to use the helmet of salvation to keep my mind in check. I need to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, to keep my mind in check. I need to use the breastplate of righteousness to keep my... I need to use... So I suddenly understood that, and the moment I got the revelation from that, it never left me. So that, no matter, like, wake me up at 2 a.m. in the morning. Usually at 2 a.m. anyway, I'm not even sleeping. But wake me up <laughs> when I'm sleeping. I will quote that verse for you easy. Do you understand? So that's the second stage. You're muttering it to yourself, and you get new revelations from these verses. And then the third stage is the not-so-quiet stage. I call it the shouting stage. Hallelujah. I call it the loud stage. Okay? Huh? <laughs> I call it the loud stage. In this third stage, what you're now doing is you are speaking in tongues. Now, what you do is you take the word that you have just learned, you take the revelations that you have gotten, and you turn it into a prayer. This is how you feed your spirit the word of God. Do you understand? The word that you have just meditated on, you've thought about it, you've muttered it, and then now you are praying over what you have gotten as a revelation. Do you understand? For example, let's say, like we just used here, uh, Psalms chapter uh, 110, verse 3. It says that um, in the day of your power, your people shall be willing, right? Or the people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. Now, I've thought about it, I've muttered it, and then I now turn that into a prayer point. What would the prayer point be? Somebody give me an example. Yes, ma'am. Lord, let me be a volunteer. Very good. So, okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Show me the beauty of holiness. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody? Psalms 110 verse 3. How would you turn that into a prayer point? Yes, sir. Let me be ready for the day of your power. Let me be ready. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, sp spiritual. Spiritual? Yeah. How? Using Psalms 110 verse 3. How would you turn Psalms 110 verse 3 into a prayer point? Um, by being more, I say, um, having that commitment, maintaining that faith, it being more spiritual in terms of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Take the verse and turn it into a prayer point. Do you have your Bible like a. Uh, um, I, I don't know if you because you just got it. I don't know yeah, yeah. Oh, you didn't hear it. Okay, so basically, this is what we're doing. We're talking about meditation. Mm -hmm. Three <coughs> stages of meditation the quiet stage of meditation, the muttering stage of meditation, and then there's the third stage. In the quiet stage, which is the first stage, you're simply taking the Word of God and you're just revising it over and over in your mind. You're thinking about it, you're getting new revelations, new understanding, 
And then the second stage is the muttering stage where you take the verses and you mutter it to yourself. All right. You usually what I like to do in the muttering stage as well is I like to personalize it. So anywhere it says Y O U, that's a small Y O U. I turn it to M E, or I say my name, Casey Bassett. Understand? So I personalize it in that stage. And then the third stage is when you turn it into a prayer point. So whatever revelations that you've gotten from the scripture, you turn that to a prayer point and you begin to pray it in tongues. This is why speaking in tongues is important. This is how you put the word of God in your spirit. Do you understand? You take that verse that you've meditated on, you've thought about it, you've muttered it, you turn it to a prayer point and you put it in your spirit and you speak it in tongues. Do you understand? Hands up if you're understanding what I'm saying. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, Daisy, but I, I just, I'd rather ask and know. Do you know, like, in when we're praying in the spirit, so far as I'm aware, but help me if not, that when there's, like, messages, that the Lord reveals that to that person, it, like there's a, an interpreter within the church. So do you know when it tells, says that the Father inter the intercess, like, because we don't know what to pray, so the Spirit prays for us. So from that little bit you've just said, are you saying, so I know, that what you've read, you're talking in tongues? Mm -hmm. I think I understand your question. Um, no, so what I'm so sorry, so what I'm asking is, is it a yes or a no? So from what you've just like meditated and read, are you talking that in, in tongues for your spirit? Yes. it's beneficial to like Paul said you'd rather us understand or be able to interpret there's some people who can actually like speak in tongues and know what essentially is being said so if you know I don't know if you're asking because you're are you asking that if you speak in tongues are you, are you, is what's being said the bit which you're trying to put in you yeah I think that's a question she's asking she's asking if Whatever it is that we've just meditated on, how do we turn, how, basically you're saying, how do we turn that into tongues? How is it possible for us to now pray that in tongues? Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go on. All right, so, th that's actually a very good question. And I'm thinking of how I'm going to answer it. Now, this, this is, I believe, very strongly, this is what's happening in the realms of the spirit. In the spiritual realm, when it's time for us to pray, of course, now, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what he wants to pray about. You understand? He knows exactly what he wants us to pray for. But then when we're praying in the, in the realms of the Spirit, what usually happens is we take a topic. That's why we use the scriptures. Because the Bible says anything we pray in line with his will. First John chapter 5, verse 14. Anything we pray in line with this, he hears us. So as long as we're praying in line with this, we can be confident God is hearing what we're saying. Do you understand? So being led of the Spirit to pray is being led to pray what is in here. In the most fundamental, most basic level of understanding, being led of the Holy Spirit to pray is being led to pray what has been written here. So if you're praying what is written here, you can be confident God is hearing what you're saying. So if you've now taken the Word of God, you've meditated on it, and you're praying from here, be 100% sure be confident God is hearing what you're saying, especially when you pray in tongues. Because what will happen is that once you've turned this into, into a prayer point and you begin to pray, the Holy Spirit will start adding and subtracting. But it's still along the same lines of what you have studied here. It's still along what you've prayed here. Do you understand? Yeah, I don't think you understand what I'm trying to say. So the, the, basically, the way, the way I'm trying to... What, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, right? I speak two languages. Right. So there's only so many people understand my language. So if I talk that now... I put guarantee nobody would know what I was on about, yeah? <laughs> so when we're speaking tongues, that's in a holy language. So so far as I know, and correct me if I'm you know, if I'm on the wrong lines, um that that's a holy language. So that can only be interpreted or when there's an interpreter. So what Is that, true? Is that what it was? Sorry? Is that what the word of God says that it can only be interpreted when there is an interpreter? To edify the church, yeah. That's, that's prophecy. That, yeah, that's prophecy. 
Yeah. So, so what, what I'm what, what what I'm saying is, so when 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 you're talking in tongues, do you know what them tongues is? So the question I asked in the original. So you've read that scripture. So when you've read that scripture, the, when you're talking in tongues, are you talking in tongues word for word? In in using the tongues for word for that scripture. That that's what I'm asking. No, you're just simply praying in the Holy Spirit. That's it. You're just taking the prayer point. And then you just begin to pray in tongues. Because the thing about tongues is that it is a blessed gift that we can use at will. If you want to pray in tongues, you can start praying in tongues right now. Anytime you want to pray in tongues, you can pray in tongues. Because the Holy Spirit has given it to you as a gift, which you can simply use whenever it is that you want. Do you understand? My misunderstanding, sorry. Yeah. So, so, so I, no, I think I, I understand what you're trying to say. Uh, the context of 1 Corinthians 14, because that's where you're quoting from. The context of that is in a church setting where people are praying, uh, where, where it looks like God wants to speak to the whole body, and then you have different people speaking in tongues at the same time. No. If God wants to speak to the whole body, like it happens here sometimes, when um, uh, Gail would be speaking in tongues and then everyone is quiet, and then somebody would interpret. So somebody like JB or even Ivan or J, uh, uh, Josh Roberts, they would interpret what has been said in tongues but when it comes to personal tongues your own personal time with god when you're meditating by yourself that's just you and god you're not in church you're probably at home it's just you and god you can speak in tongues however you like now the holy spirit can certainly tell you what you are saying and actually when you are praying i think it's a good thing to ask him what you're saying it's a good thing but then at the end of the day when you're praying in tongues it's not everything that he's going to tell you that you said because i can guarantee you this praying in english Five minutes of speaking in tongues is way more than 20 hours of praying in your own understanding. You've done more in the spirit with just five minutes of speaking in tongues than you can with praying in tongues in your own understanding. And one thing, I, I've understood this because anytime, anytime you're praying in your own understanding, think about it like this. Speaking in tongues is coded, all right? First Corinthians 13, and then I, it says, Yea, do I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. So speaking in tongues, you're talking to angels. So it's a coded language. Say, for example, we're at war, which we are in the realms of the spirit. You're at war. You don't want your enemies to understand what you're saying. So you would code it so that you can give it to your allies. So speaking in tongues is the same thing. When you're speaking in tongues, you're speaking a coded language that your allies, the angels, you can see that in Hebrews 1.14, your allies, the angels understand you. The enemy does not understand. Satan does not understand tongues. Do you understand? Amen. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand it. He can't decode it. It is one blessed thing that we, especially now, after the death of Jesus, Jesus uh, have been permitted to enjoy. The ability to speak directly to God without Satan understanding what we're saying. If Satan understands, then obviously he can basically reorganize to fight whatever it is because he understands what you're saying. But then because he doesn't understand, he can't really do that. Go ahead. Yeah, so just so I understand what you're saying in my head final of this part we're talking about you can ask once you've spoken in tongues for God to reveal what you've said but it doesn't mean he's going to fully reveal everything but in faith you are You're doing it knowing that and trusting that it's going in that's right exactly exactly do you know sometimes when you speak in tongues or when you, how do you know I know this is going to sound a little bit I'm just going to say it that it's tongue and it's some and then it's not, you're not just saying noise. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And the simple answer to that is that anytime you have doubts while speaking in tongues, know for certain that it is Satan who is causing you to doubt. And Satan is a liar and he's always been a liar. Because I can tell you this, if your tongues is useless, Satan wouldn't tell you. If your tongues is having no effect and your tongues is rubbish, he wouldn't tell you. Because obviously he wants you to waste your time. So why would he tell you that what you're saying doesn't make any sense? He wouldn't tell you. So the fact that you're having these doubts means that Satan is trying to convince you to stop praying. Because he knows what you're doing. Do you understand? Sometimes you have to think, not that you're thinking like the devil. No, I'm hey. thinking like the devil. But, you know, you, the, the Bible says, do not be ignorant of the devices of the enemy. To be ignorant of the devices of Satan is to not know the tactics of Satan, to not know what he does. So I'm exposing him to you now. That anytime you suddenly have this doubt in your mind that, oh, maybe I'm not saying, maybe this tongue is coming from me, maybe this is not the Holy Ghost, know for a fact, Satan is the one who's lying to you. And he's doing that simply to stop you from praying because he knows the effect that your speaking in tongues is having. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, 100% what he said. And I'd also say, um, there's people in this church who speak an African language. Now, when you hear them speak, it sounds just gibberish. But we never doubt what they say. Now, if you was to, you, you can go to them and say to them, hey, teach me your language. And when they tell you to say something, you would say it because you know it's an official language. The problem is we don't believe that God has his own language and that's why we doubt. And just like I said, the enemy will lie to you and say, oh, you're just talking gibberish. But if you think most languages, because you can't understand them, sounds gibberish. Yeah, it's Does so that true. Make sense? Sometimes if you're speaking in tongues, especially if you're not used to doing it, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to sound too loud because I'm going to sound stupid or someone's going to think yeah. I'm not really talking in. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, it's like, and I'm sure it's not, I'm not just on my own. No, no, no. A lot of, I, I, a lot of people, but I, as, as I said, if, if you hear most people, I've heard some people speak here, you know, in their native language, and it's like, wow, you know, it sounds like, you know, but it's their language, you know, and you wouldn't, you, we wouldn't necessarily oh, that's you. But just like that, we have languages to, to communicate in this realm. There is a heavenly language that God uses that we also communicate in a heavenly realm. Actually, God. sorry, sorry, sorry. Go on, go on. Yeah, this is why I said in this third stage, it's the loud stage. Because what you're doing is that now you're praying in tongues and you're <coughs> literally shouting down the enemy. Because he's going to try to speak to you in this stage. He's already been trying to speak to you in the first two stages. In your mind, he was throwing things at you. And so he was trying to distract you. And then when you begin to mutter, he continues doing the same thing. Don't let him do that in the third stage. In the third stage, you make noise. Make some noise. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I personally, anyway, I don't know. Sometimes, I think maybe you guys have heard it. When I'm praying, I, I make noise. Mm. And the reason... <laughs> No. <laughs> the reason, the reason <laughs> she said no. No, there, there's a reason to it. And it's not like I'm doing these things just because, you know, I just want to make a lot of noise. No, the reason why I'm doing it is because your mind and your mouth are related to one another symbiotically. In other words, they depend on one another. If you want to think certain thoughts, use your mouth to command your mind to think those thoughts. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yeah. You can actually command your mind to think certain thoughts. You can command your mind to do certain things. And one of the ways to do that is to shout your mind down. Say, hey, mind, what are you doing? Make noise. You know, sometimes when, <laughs> sometimes when I'm praying, I, just, I make a lot. I do, do, once again, I'm, I'm shouting down my own mind to make sure I'm focused in the place of prayer. And then other times it's simply because the Holy Ghost in me is just so strong and I just feel the energy. It's so There's so much energy like literally buzzing through me. I can't help but shout. It just comes out like a shout. And there are there's some, I know there are people here who have experienced this, but you guys are a bit shy, you know? Like sometimes when you're here in church and you know that the loudness wants to come through, but you lower your voice, you're too shy. Don't be shy, don't be shy. Really do, if you want to shout, shout. We're in the present. The Bible says in Romans, in, sorry, Psalms 100, make a joyful what? Noise. Make a joyful noise. It's not a sin to make noise. I know we're in the UK and everyone likes it, <laughs> but it's not a sin to make noise. Sometimes you got to make some noise. You have to make some noise. It's actually important. The Bible even says that everywhere in this, this earth and the heavens, the Bible says will be destroyed with a shout. With a shout. God, even God, when he speaks, his whisper shakes heaven. When he's whispering, it shakes everything. Everything, everything is shaken. Now imagine if he shouts. Imagine if he shouts. So if God, my whisper, my shout is nothing compared to God's whisper. I can tell you that. So I, I like shouting. Sorry, Tim, you were going to say something. And then we'll say, I'll finish first. Um, I hope I agree with you because this time, uh, you know, you can rebuke the, the thoughts of the enemy that's in mad thought. And um, yeah, like your mind instantly just stops. It's like as if you've literally just taken that into captivity. Exactly. And um, absolutely. I think even myself, like now you, you said that I've, I've done that, but not here. Like I've had some, and I'm like, no, no, no. Like, you know, it's like when you're loud, it's like it's hard to be thinking something else because you're literally, it's like, you're just, ah, and it's like your mind is like focused on what you're, so it's like, yeah. So, so you can tell the really focused people in prayer. You can tell. <laughs> you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's say, for instance, you, you grow up, you grow up, you grow up not speaking the tongues in like, it's certainly not like certain African Obviously, I'm not 
brought to speak a certain African native language, obviously mine come from the West Indies. It's obviously patois, it's, it's very, it's very what plural English could call it. It's very, in that sense, as a language like that, it's very, like you could say, it's very baited English in terms of how you put it down, how you broke it down. Yeah. And what are you asking? What I'm asking is that in terms of like, how can you increase the level if, you're, if you come from speaking patois in terms of, how can, I, how can you, how can you upgrade it in terms of from speaking patois? Upgrade what? You're speaking in tongues? Yeah, in terms of like, like if you come from like learning like basic things like patois or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I can tell you something that speaking in tongues doesn't really have anything to do with your native language. If it did, then it wouldn't be tongues. It has nothing to do with your native language. Tongues is similar to other languages in the sense that the more you speak it, the greater your vocabulary. So the Bible actually even says, Mark 16, 17, these are the signs of they that believe. They'll cast out demons and they'll speak in new what? Tongues. New tongues. Oh. Say it with passion, new word. Tongues, plural. There's an S on the end. So if your tongues has sounded the same for years, there's a problem. There's a problem. Yamaha Suzuki. Yamaha Suzuki. Yamaha Suzuki. That's been, <laughs> that's been your tongues for years. It's time, it's time to upgrade. <laughs> your tongues, the same tongues for yet it's time for it to change it should change it should upgrade you understand that is and the, the way that will happen is when you are refreshed you are baptized once again with the holy spirit being baptized with the holy spirit is not a one-time event it can happen severally over time you can look at you can find this in the bible in the book of uh psalms 119 verse 154 revive me psalms 119 verse 156 revive psalms 119 verse 159 revive you see, it mentions revive, revive, revive. Why? Because you should be revived more than once. Mm -hmm. You can be revived continually, continuously. Yeah. Psalms 80 verse 18. Quicken my spirit and I will call upon your name. The reason why people struggle to pray is because their spirits has not been revived. If you want to pray, ask God to revive your spirit. Tell him to wake wake your spirit up. Yeah, I was going to say the more like you make it part of your everyday life. Like, I know we're like, learning like a foreign language. Yeah. They say the best way to make it like into it is to immerse yourself in the culture, to make it part of your everyday life. So with time, like the more like you make it a part of your everyday life, like let's say you're at work and something gets to be nervous and you don't know what to say to like, you're just speaking in time, like even if you just say the phrase, right? The more you get used to it yourself, the less you're thinking about the world. There have been so many times when I'm praying and then suddenly my tongues completely changes and it could even sound like a normal language. Like I've had times when my tongue sounded like I'm speaking Aramaic or it sounded like I'm speaking Chu, which is funny. I find that hilarious. Or it sounded like I'm even speaking Portuguese that it changes it changes frequently and it surprises me when it does because i'm like oh this is nice go ahead um in terms of like praying like when i was learning powerpoint um i've been going to a few nigerian prayer uh, circles and uh, yeah if you want to if you want to sort of be more confident and loud go and go in a, a nigerian prayer circle. no it's true you know we do that we do that here actually we do that here at midnight Sunday midnight into Monday for one hour. We're here praying. We've got some food, a few people here that do that. You know, Sunday midnight, Monday midnight, and then also on Friday midnight into Saturday. And then we just come here into the church and we pray and we pray with like passion and just energy. There's so much energy everywhere. We're very good. Anyway, we're gonna finish for tonight. Thank you everybody for coming to Bible studies. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, next week we're gonna be uh, doing a talking about a similar topic, but this time the topic is going to be on the flip side of the coin, which is how do you know when God has spoken to you? How can you tell when God has spoken to you? It's good to have all the prerequisites, your heart is right, you're praying, and you have the word of God, but then how can you tell when God has now spoken that to you? Understand? So that's what we're going to do next week. Hallelujah. Head bow. <clears throat> uh, I'm praying for everybody here that uh, we have truly understood and gained enlightenment about what it is, what